I miss Tokyo. I miss Tokyo so much that this morning, as I was about to make my way to work using my Easling card, I nearly took out my Pasmo card so that I could tap, um, you know, to enter the station. And at work, I just keep thinking about Tokyo. I just keep thinking about my routine while I was there because what I would do is I would wake up in the morning and sometimes I would, you know, spend an hour or so at the arcade. So I'd start my mornings with one round of maybe a House of the Dead or something. Um, maybe one or two rounds and then I'll do the same thing at night. It's just sort of like my way of starting and concluding the day. And I got very used to that routine. And when I came back here, I tried to replicate that. Um, so I went to the first arcade that I could find and I tried playing House of the Dead again and it just wouldn't, the machines just weren't well maintained so I couldn't shoot right and that was such an unsatisfying play. And so yeah, I felt a bit depressed after that and so I didn't really see anybody um, you know, being at the arcade by themselves, which is the norm in Tokyo, and I was doing just that. Now, there's a few things about Tokyo that I've realized. I can't people watch in peace. People in Tokyo have wandering eyes. If you look at them, chances are they're probably going to catch you and look back at you. At least that was my experience, so maybe I would be on a train and be observing a salary man. Just be looking at him and just be thinking what's really going through his mind right now. And I'd catch him just looking back at me maybe a few minutes later. Could be looking at a woman, I could be thinking, she's so beautiful. I love the features on her face, I love her hairstyle for today. And the next thing you know, she catches me looking at her and I have to look away. Very embarrassedly, is it? It's just, um, you know, they, they know they're aware, I think, something about... Japanese people, they're able to intuit um, a lot of things. They're able to read body language, they're able to sense eye contact from the peripherals of their vision, stuff like that. Very, very much, um, just gestures in general, they're able to read that. Like, you could be looking at a map, and I could be standing slightly behind this man looking at a map, and he'd move aside because he could sense that I was trying to get a better look at it. It's that kind of, um, you know, sense, I think. It's, it's quite interesting, actually. But at the same time, I felt like in Korea, when I was alone, I was very ignored as a solo traveler. I felt like people didn't look at me, and um, when I was on the verge of disappearing all the time, it's almost as if um, I... I think after a week there, I almost wanted, to, after five days in fact, I think I wanted to beg to be looked at. I wanted to have someone talk to me and not try to sell me something. I remember thinking that. I remember sitting opposite these two men and they were blue collar workers. They were brothers. I don't know if they're brothers, I honestly can't tell. But they looked alike. Um, I think, actually, just think they were friends. And uh, the reason why I thought they were related was because they both had a very bad case of weather-beaten skin. Um, and they were just sitting at the bench just outside the convenience store and they were sharing some fish snacks and a soda and they were, you know, um, you know, having, what do you call that, cheersing each other on that, cheering each other, when you, you know, cheers your drink, I don't know, what's the actual verb for it, I forgot, sorry. Um, but basically they were just, you know, um, having a good time on a weekend and every other person out there was out with their boyfriend or girlfriend and there was just the two of them sitting at this bench outside the convenience store. And I was there too and they sat opposite me and there was just silence the entire time as in they didn't talk to me and I didn't talk to them. But I realized right then and then that it's such a waste not to be able to learn um, the language because... I want to know so much what they're saying, um, and as expected as a solo female traveler, you do get some stares here and there, so, I mean, I could feel that they were looking at me, I, I knew, um, that they were, and 
There were also moments where I would go to izakayas by myself, but they were chain izakayas. They weren't like the very Japanesey ones. They were just very international. So there's a tori toriki zoku, I think. That one, that was the one I kept going to because they had an English menu and made everything very easy. And so I would go there and I would um, order food and I'll sit by myself and occasionally I'll be like sitting in the couple seat. Um, so next to me would be like two other diners and if they were both men I could feel that they were staring. So I just think in general men in Japan just tend to check out other people quite a bit. Um, maybe out of curiosity, maybe out of more than that, I don't know, because on my last last day in Tokyo, I actually, and I looked disgusting by the way, so it was raining, my hair was greasy and wet with rain, I think my makeup was smudged even, um, and smudged really badly, it's to the point that I looked like I had, you know, like, like a female elf in Death Note or something, and um, yeah, my, my lips were dry and chapped, I had a massive breakout on my chin because I had been consuming about five cakes and ice creams every day in Tokyo. That's just matcha desserts everywhere, and so that was what I was doing. I looked disgusting, basically, and I was in this maroon dress that I always wear to work, and I had a black cardigan on, and my dress was, I think, the hem falls just past my knees, so I was very conservatively dressed. Very, in fact, dressed for a corporate setting, if anything. Um, and somehow when I was standing, and my phone had died because I had been using Google Maps the entire day. I had visited Kawasaki in the same day, and I just crammed every activity that I didn't manage to accomplish in my entire week there, all onto my last day. So I was exhausted, and um, my phone was dead, and I just stood there outside Taito Station, um, near in Shinjuku at first by myself, and I noticed that a lot of people were looking at me, like everybody who walked past just sort of looked at me as I stood there waiting for the rain to stop, because it was raining, so I was just there waiting for the rain to stop, I couldn't afford to fall sick, um, I was already down with the flu and everything, I didn't want to, you know, exacerbate that, and so every person, I noticed that as I was standing there, um, everybody who walked past gave me like this, did a double take. And I was confused. I thought at first maybe I had maybe like a really gigantic breakout on my face or something. Um, maybe I looked really ugly. I don't know. Maybe I had something funny on my face. Maybe they saw me. They thought maybe I could use an umbrella. It could be the Japanese police. Thing. So I thought okay. Um, I didn't really understand why. Maybe I looked really ugly that day. So I decided to just run back in the rain. Um, and then I went out of the subway from. Shinjuku back to where I stayed, which is Ikebukuro, and at Ikebukuro, I got out of the station exit, and yeah, so I got out at the north exit, because that's where my hotel, that's how I get to my hotel, and yes, apparently north Ikebukuro is a red light district, but I was still standing quite a distance away from all the hostess clubs that were in the area, and the funny thing is, as I was standing there, I, w I was met with the same sort of looks that, um, I got earlier when I was standing outside Taito Station at Shinjuku. This, um, I don't know, it's like, it's inquisitive, it's transactional, it's a sizing you up sort of thing. And I suddenly felt like I wasn't very safe. Um, it's always very sunny and safe in Singapore, so I'm not used to these things. I'm not used to walking into bookstores and finding like a porno section or seeing red light district workers out at night. I'm just not used to it, um, especially in main areas. So it's like, I don't know, it's like seeing sex workers in Orchard Road or something. It's, it's weird, I think. Um, but that was what I was seeing. Um, yeah, but anyway, the area that I was standing at, there, there weren't any sex workers hanging around. It was really just me. Um, and I was standing there waiting for the rain to stop again. I really had to wait. It was just freezing and I felt like I was going to get was it hypothermia at some point. It was just so cold. It was the day before the typhoon had hit Tokyo as well. And that's why the weather was so fucked up. And, um, yeah, so I was, I was there and suddenly... Um, this man approached me, this Japanese man, and he spoke to me in Japanese, um, because I have an East Asian face, so I think everybody just assumes that I am Japanese, um, and to be fair, I think when I'm there, I do dress a bit like them, and because my 
my colors, my, my typical wardrobe is kind of dull by default. Like the colors are very modest and conservative. And I did buy like one or two items from um, Goo and from Uniqlo. So is it Goo or GU? I don't know how they say it there. I think it's GU. So I did. Um, I do understand where that's coming from. And I myself can't tell East Asians apart from Japanese people because the range is so diverse, which is actually what makes people watching so interesting there because of the diversity. I love it. It's amazing how such an homogenous race can be so diverse in their terms of, um, in terms of their facial features and their sense of fashion senses. Really interesting. Anyway, that's besides the point. So he approached me and he said something to me in Japanese, and all I could manage was, um, uh, sumimasen nihongo nihongo wa wakarimasen, which is I don't understand Japanese. I think, I think that's what it means. And so I said that, and he sort of understood maybe right there and then that I wasn't um, Japanese and I think he got slightly kind of like oh shit um, maybe she's not she's not Japanese she's not a sex worker and so uh, I kind of walked away awkwardly um, but yeah there was like some some pointing at like my body parts there was some looking you know uh, and the second guy there's the second man who approached me did the same thing asked me something in Japanese I told him I didn't understand and by the time I got to the third guy, I understood what was going on very clearly. I was like, okay, so they think I am the sex worker. At first I thought maybe it was just this one man who made this mistake, and that the second guy was coming up to me because he wanted to ask if I needed, um, if I wanted to share his umbrella with him, like if I needed shelter or something like that. I was naive enough to think that, um, and, and stupid enough to believe that a stranger in the street would offer me their umbrella or something like that that's not what they were after so um yeah I, I learned that they were really looking for sex and that they thought that i was a sex worker and i didn't know how they thought that way because i was very very conservatively dressed once again and i looked like shit so unless you have really extremely low standards and you don't know what you're spending your money on you would not approach me so i was going through so much confusion at the same time a part of me was very excited by it i don't know i felt like the typhoon was gonna hit tokyo tomorrow and um and my phone was dead and these men were shady and creepy and i could just get raped and murdered i don't know there was a, a kind of thrill there um in knowing that uh, i was slightly in danger but also japan's pretty safe even if you are in danger just don't be stupid don't be blackout drunk by yourself as a female traveler in the middle of the streets and i think you'll be fine but a part of me always wants to do that it wants to be in dangerous situations um i don't know why so but i, I was really scared because the third guy was really aggressive he stretched his hand out and sort of forcefully i think asked me to take it or something i was I'm, I'm basing this off like what i read from his body language um and i said no and i just sort of like um backed away a bit and then he got really angry and then he said something in japanese and then he walked off and i thought that was the end of that but then as i continued standing there waiting for the rain to stop i noticed that he paced back and forth at um this he paced back and forth like he was going back and forth and he was looking at me the entire time. He was making this really prolonged eye contact. It was it was very uncomfortable and I got a bit scared. And so that's when I decided to just run home in the rain. Um, and I just felt like, I don't know, I felt so lonely right there. I felt like I couldn't, if something really were to happen to me, like I would just die, nobody would know. And nobody would stop to help. I mean, that's a kind of coldness I thought I felt a bit from Tokyo. Um, from the people in Tokyo. If I really love the city, I can't say that the people really enchanted me all that much. I mean, in terms of... The people are very beautiful, physically beautiful. The really beautiful ones are really beautiful. The really ugly ones look like gyozas or something, but... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was very charmed by their appearances, but maybe not so much um, personality. I feel like when it comes to personality, the Koreans take the cake. They're just so charming. Um, but yeah, I just felt like all of a sudden, I, I, I was kind of sad, you know, it was me running in the rain, in the wind, close to midnight, and, um, yeah, I was just, I was trying to get away from a creepy old man in a city, all of a sudden I just felt so terribly alone, and, 
um, I don't know, I was kind of excited and sad at the same time. I mean, here I was thinking that someone was trying to offer me their umbrella and really they just thought that I was a sex worker and I, I don't know, just, I mean, I, th I keep thinking I know these things, I keep thinking that I'm such a pervert myself. Um, I always say, I always say that I'm like an old man trapped in a woman's body, but I am and, and I am exposed to all these perversions. Um, but they mostly take place in my mind. I mean, I wouldn't go out there and and actually do these things. I mean, I mean, for one, I'm curious. And actually, when they were asking, I thought to troll them a bit. I thought to be all, uh, well, I'm actually this exotic Southeast Asian sex worker in the streets of Tokyo. You know, I felt like playing that whole part. Um, like pretending to be Thai or Vietnamese or something. Um, as soon as it became clear that I couldn't speak Japanese, I just wanted to find out more about these men. I wanted to know what they worked as, uh, what the daytime jobs were, why they were looking out for some fun at night, you know, like, did they have kids? How old were their kids? I thought they looked like my dad's age, actually. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> How old did they think I was? Why did they approach me when it was very obvious that I wasn't dressed like the other sex workers? Most of them were Japanese, very clearly Japanese, and they wore mini skirts or schoolgirl outfits, things that revealed a lot of their legs. And yeah, it was just very clear. And they were holding onto signboards. I was holding onto a fucking, a fucking Don Don Quijote like plastic bag with matcha Kit Kats in it. I just don't know how you could mistake that. So a part of me is just confused and maybe even a little frustrated because I don't know how. They connected the dots that way and the other part of me is curious and excited and the other part of me is is also disgusted i mean it's so many things at once that i feel now that's what i love about tokyo i think it's the decadence you know the ability to explore human vices at any given time i mean it's the possibilities they're all out there it was me getting approached by host club boys at kabukicho at like 9 p.m and most of them were just very jaded and they approached in a very gruff and purposeful manner i think i don't know if i mentioned this earlier i hope i did but you could tell that um yeah that the manner of approaching was just very very rough something about it i, I didn't like i like gentle gentle mannered good mannered boys um so i did actually get approached by one of them who was kind of sweet um but he was clearly younger than the rest the rest were probably my age, maybe older by a few years or so, just that, maybe even younger, just that this, the drinking and the smoking really just make them age so much. Um, and so I did get approached by this one boy who couldn't be more than 20, I think, probably my brother's age. And and he was so sweet about it, like you could see there was something, um, he wasn't too jaded yet. Um, and, the, and he hesitated a bit, but he still approached anyway. And and so with everyone else it just said no thank you or daijoku desu which is um it's all right i think um so when i say no thank you it's like um i'm a foreigner please don't interest me any further in your services i can't communicate with you um but in his case i said sorry i'm not japanese and i sort of gave him an apologetic smile um and he said oh sorry you know with that japanese way of saying it it was just very cute um, and that's when I realized I felt such a confusing mixture of sisterly love because he was about the same age as my brother. I wanted to love him. I wanted to make sure that he was safe, especially in the line of work like that. I'm sure he's not an idiot, but you know, to be in a, in a line of work like that, I'm assuming it's, it's full of backstabbing and manipulation and dirty politics. And I just don't want someone that young to be so, to be corrupted at such a young age and I just had this protective big sister instinct um I just thought about if my brother was doing a job like that my younger brother I mean I would disapprove so much and I would hold him back from Tokyo I would just go there and drag him back um and I was just thinking about his parents and I thought about his siblings maybe maybe he had an older sister somewhere who really disapproved and the worst part was I was uh, so kind of charmed by just how cute he was I thought it was the way he approached it was just without you know that that hesitation there um that lack of jadedness that those gentle manners the the way he reverted to um english 
as soon as I said that I wasn't Japanese, you know, he didn't say Gomenasai, he said, usually they'll say Gomenasai or like Sumimasen, but he said sorry, like sorry, like in that Japanese way. I was just amused and so many things and that's when I realized, my god, I don't have morals, I am such a filthy person and I can be tempted by such things and, um, and I'm not even talking about it like sexually, you know, it would be better if I just thought about things in, in a regular penis and vagina sort of sex or penis and asshole kind of sex or whatever. Um, it would be a lot better if I could just process things in terms of like oral or penetrative sex. Um, but I don't even think of that. I just think of, because I'm pretty asexual by default, um, these things don't interest me. I think about more perverse forms of like power play and that's what gets me off. I mean, that's what I'm aroused by. And I just worried so much. I mean, I mean, I have fetishes of my own that I don't really want to explore and that I'm not very proud of. Um, but I also, at the same time, I want to venture into them. I want to know, and I feel like it's a safe space to explore it with these people, with like these host club boys or whatever. These boys who I'm, you know, you're paying to to get to be entertained, and I get the safety of that kind of transaction because I know that within. The moment you step into a host club, it's like, you pay for that kind of attention. It's very straightforward. It's a transaction with very clear rules. It's not like real life interactions where you've got to intuit, you've got to read between the lines, you've got to play guessing games, and you've got to take a gamble and never know if the person will return. You know, never know if that would be a worthy investment, you know. I, I just don't know if there would be good returns or whatever. And I don't know, I just can't, I prefer a transactional relationship to something more real and warm and substantial and long term, I think. I just can't do regular human relationships, I think. I just can't, if something in me is just broken, maybe. Like, I can't, I can't do regular sexual relationships, I can't do regular romantic ones, I can't even really do regular platonic relationships, I can't even keep up with my friends half the time. I just have such a tendency to withdraw into myself and to be entirely in my own world, entirely in my own universe, and, and I'm so selfish, you know. It's very hard to love a person like that, I think. I don't deserve to be loved by anyone and I don't want to. For the longest time, I used to think that was the only thing I was searching for. You know, this love from someone. Love from family, from friends, from partners. I thought for the longest time that was what I was searching for, but I don't know really. I mean, lately I've just been feeling like, I've just been feeling all over the place. I mean, I either feel super excited talking about how I got mistaken for a sex worker or hostess in Japan or something like that. and feeling like if the typhoon really hit, that was my opportunity. I mean, I just wanted to do that. I wanted the typhoon to hit on the day I was about to leave. I wanted my flight to be cancelled. I wanted good reason to never come back. I was going to take that opportunity to just disappear once and for all. Sell my body and make a living out of it, something like that. I mean, maybe I won't sell it. I don't know, because I'm very disgusted by my own body and that's why I can't process things sexually. I feel like to want to have a sexual relationship with another person that has to be a part of you that gets off slightly um you know you have to be somewhat attracted to yourself in the first place a little bit i mean because sex itself i mean you know the whole filming it and engaging in it masturbation all that i mean there has to be some idea of um being okay with seeing your body sexually I'm not okay with seeing my body sexually, I don't want to. Firstly, I don't think it deserves to be seen sexually, and secondly, I don't want to. I like it the way it is, um, untouched, you know. I just don't want to corrupt that if it makes any sense. I don't, I don't like my body to begin with, and I don't really like other human bodies either. If I see it, I think about how, I think about more sadistic size and how that can pleasure me, but I don't want to have any kind of, like, real entanglements with them, if it makes any sense at all. It's almost like I can't think of relationships or anything in 
conventional ways and I want to, I'm trying harder because I think it's important to form healthy human relationships. Um, I just can't seem to do it. I'm not interested. And maybe that was why Japan was so fascinating. I felt like I have so many abnormal people there. I mean, and, and you really had to like look longer to find them because people seem so normal on the outside. But after, I mean, after 8 p.m. or after 9 p.m., I mean, that's where they go wild and they get drunk and stuff like that. And you start to see what they really like. And I love to observe people. I love to people watch. I would totally love to watch a scene of, like, the salary man approaching a hostess, except that I didn't want to be the hostess. <laughs> I didn't want to be personally involved in that situation. But also, it was pretty cool. And it's not something that happens here. In, in sunny and safe Singapore and this will always be home for me I mean I always love um, this country because of my attachments to it the fact that I grew up here and my family is here my friends are here but I'm so I don't know I just feel like I want to see the whole world right now and I want to die by the time I'm 25 which is next year so the k-pop star Sally actually killed herself yesterday and I've just been like I mean, I'm sad on one hand, but I'm also so inspired to read that. I, I want to end my life too, and I want to keep going. I just feel like I know for a fact that my obsession with women who have taken their own lives comes from a fact that, from some belief that I will join their ranks at some point, I will go down the same path, that I will take my own life, and I know that I will, you know, unless maybe some kind of unfortunate accident happens along the way, and that kind of robs me of that I don't know, I might even die from natural causes I don't know, but I just feel like I have this very strong feeling that if in the moment I was born I always felt like I walked around thinking that suicide eventually is how I will end it all just felt like I knew it somehow and so I was obsessed with Dayo Kim the model I was obsessed with Crystal Aki Mizuguchi this girl who killed herself after getting her A-level results I was obsessed with Sylvia Plath um the poet who killed herself too, um, a couple of other people, I mean, just quite a number, and I can add Sally to this list as well, and I don't know, I just, I feel like I wasn't meant to live beyond 25, and I look at myself and I feel like I already look like I'm 40 or something, um, and some people might disagree, some people think I'm still like in college, first year of college or something, I don't know, I look at myself and I think, I just can't see someone who is young and full of hope and someone who's sprightly but I never was that person even when I was younger I always felt like I was a lot older than I really was or but then again you see some old people who are just full of hope and zest for life so age I don't know age isn't really a thing I, maybe we go by weariness so if we're talking about weariness then yes I've been very wary for weary weary sorry not wary I've been very weary for a very long time. And because of that, I always feel like I'm like a hundred years old or something. And I'm just done. I don't care anymore. I don't care about my so-called ambition to become a teacher. For some time, I talked about it. Talked about how I wanted to be a teacher. I don't care about that anymore. I feel as if I'm not qualified because I have such a, such a corrupted and problematic moral compass, you know. I don't feel like I deserve to be in a classroom anymore. I don't feel like I'm sincere enough. I don't feel like I care even. I just don't have interest in any of that. I just want to, if it makes any sense at all, I just want to take, I want to quit my job right now and I want to spend 1.5 months in Japan fucking every person in sight. Even though I don't want to fuck anyone. I just want to feel used and I just want to hit people. I just want to strangle them. I just want to... I just want to whip them, I just want to do everything that's depraved and immoral and pleasurable for me. And I want to explore my sadistic side. And I want to get into fights, I don't know, I just want to... If it makes any sense at all, I just don't... I don't know what I'm doing. I just don't want to be here. happening I just I don't know I just want to be a porn star I want to be a stripper 
I just wish I were born beautiful. I mean, I would have done it without hesitation at all. I would have done it in a blink of an eye. I would have just straight up gone to, like, the first porn studio that I could find and just given them my rates or something and just volunteered to do that for a living. Just because they think it's so fun to be depraved. It's hilarious, really. I mean, I don't know. But on the other hand, I mean, I believe, like, I believe in stupid things, I believe in, like, um, making the world a better place. <laughs> I believe in, like, saving the environment. I believe in, like, building orphanages for kids, and... <sighs> I'm conducting classes for them for free, and because education is important, and I wish people could have the joy of reading. I just feel so conflicted. I just feel like I can't be one person. I just want to be one person. I just want to be consistent. But I'm not. My emotions fluctuate. I feel like sometimes. I can't help but feel like I just want to be like this used... Used as fuck whore. Other times I feel like I just want to protect everyone. You know. Try to make sure that people love them. And I will love them if no one else will. And it's so confusing. Because I don't know what I'm gonna do from here. I don't know if I don't know if tomorrow I'm gonna get tired of living and I'm gonna jump off like a jump down in the twenty first story of some building or something like that. Or if I'm gonna order some matcha ice cream and be really happy about it. And I have my interview by the way coming up for the teaching position. I just don't I think I'm a very suitable candidate anymore at this juncture. I feel so corrupted and so ruined and... You know, I just... I just don't deserve to be in a classroom as much as I want to. I think I'm afraid of the rejection. I mean, what if they reject me again? And it's the one thing that I thought I wanted. Maybe I still do. Just that. Maybe to save myself the disappointment, I've crafted this narrative that I don't care, you know, I don't care what I get. I don't really want it, stuff like that. And then I... It's, there's some truth to it, definitely. I definitely think I'm less sincere about it now than I was back then. But I also have more experience now than I do back then. Than I did back then, I mean. But yeah, it's confusing. I don't know. I don't do it anymore. I just feel like such a waste of space to to everyone and everything and I'm just gonna continue as long as I continue respiring, I am going to continue consuming resources. I'm gonna continue living on this earth and breathing as much air, drinking as much water, eating as much food as you are, maybe even more, even though I'm not doing anything to positively affect society. I'm not doing any good in any way. And if I do do good, there usually are multiple ulterior motives or other motivations going on. And I know, and from time to time, I feel like I just want to own a host club. And I just want to do very depraved things to people. And I just, I don't know, I just feel like I'm confused with my sexuality. I'm confused with my aspirations. I'm confused with how I feel about my family and friends. Why? Why is it that I love them so much, but I don't reply a single text message when I'm away? I don't call back. I don't... You know, I just don't do it until I come back, and they have to call me because they're worried. They're like the typhoon caught me or something, and... I'm a terrible friend. I'm a terrible person. And I look at people so reductively sometimes. I mean, that's what I do when I people watch, just reduce people into trends and stereotypes and observations. That's all I do. I generalize. Why do I find that fun? Why do I find being in slightly threatening positions or dangerous positions fun? Why do I enjoy getting mistaken for a sex worker despite not even being able to own up to that title because I don't even do the sort of 
you know, you could say dignified work that they do. I can't even boast of that. This is like being mistaken for one. That's how lazy I am. It's horrible. That's why I'm a horrible person. I always have been. Well, that's the end of this vlog entry, I think. Um, yeah, I, forgot. I think I've said what I had to say. And yeah, I'm sorry I cried towards the end. I just feel like my emotions are all over the place right now. I'm both. I'm excited, I'm stimulated, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm angry. I'm mostly angry, though. I'm always angry. And just thrilled. I don't know why I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I don't know.